Thank you. Mr. Turner has uh, graciously allowed this to proceed, even though he's not back yet. So with that, uh, Mr. Berlin, I want to thank you again for your forbearance and patience. I noticed that you've been married for 39 years and the father of four, so I assume that you have plenty of patience. Uh, <laughs> and that, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me, first of all. Uh, and rather than simply summarize what I've put down that you can read, let me just make a couple of brief um, statements, uh, perhaps just three. Um, the first will sound simple, but nonetheless I think is important, and that is to emphasize that any approach to dealing with issues of sexual abuse must be comprehensive. Um, we wouldn't dream of trying to solve the multiple problems associated with alcoholism simply by getting tougher on drunk drivers or maybe putting them on some kind of a registry, and yet society's approach to this problem, in my judgment, at least in recent years, has emphasized correctly criminal justice approach, but very little about education, about prevention, about the kinds of things that I feel are important. Uh, to really address this issue, we have to look at um, problems that are intrinsic in a system. For example, are there, are there factors in a system that deter either victims and or offenders from coming forward and, and identifying themselves and getting help. Uh, we have to identify vulnerable individuals and try to be of assistance to them. There are many people who are struggling to integrate their sexual needs into an otherwise productive and responsible lifestyle, and yet often those people go unidentified and we don't see them until it's too late. The second point I want to make, and it's probably the most uh, difficult one, particularly from the political point of view, is that I believe if we're really going to solve this problem, we have to stop uh, looking at this dichotomy uh, that suggests that one's either concerned for victims or concerned for offenders. Uh, I would argue that the best favor that one can do a prospective victim is to keep he or she from becoming victimized in the first place, and we can only do that by learning more about those factors that predispose individuals to become offenders. I think we have made it difficult for offenders who want to get help before the fact to step forward. I can give an example, actually, of a gentleman who, um, in his final year at a military academy within the past few years, um, was court-martialed and had to leave because he had begun to download child pornography. Uh, this was a man who knew that he had a problem. Uh, he desperately had wanted help, but he was extremely afraid to raise his hand and identify himself because of what it would likely have done to his military career. Uh, he knew that if he sought help that that might be reported to the commanders, and I do understand that what's best for the military has to come first, but it deterred him from seeking help. Uh, and uh, he had to hear names like, like pervert and predator attached to him, and I can assure you that that's not particularly helpful. Uh, this was a very nice young man who had a serious problem, and yet, um, you know, it's, it's hard for anyone with any psychiatric issue to raise their hand and ask for help. It can sometimes be particularly difficult in a military setting where people learn that they need to be tough and deal with issues, and it can be particularly difficult for people that are struggling to try to integrate their sexual needs into a, into a proper lifestyle. The final point I'll make, and I'll make it because we're in a legislative body, is that, in my judgment, so much of what's been done legislatively in recent years has been based on the exception rather than the rule. Uh, in other words, we hear about some absolutely horrible crime. A child is uh, kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and murdered, and uh, understandably there's tremendous emotion, a sense that we need to do something, and we try to proceed to, to, to take action. Uh, and the example I'm giving, however, which is an example of sexual abuse, uh, that kind of situation represents a fraction of 1% of the overall problem. And so it begs the question in my mind that do we have the most effective public policies when public policy begins to be driven by the exception rather than the rule? Uh, there are many people who uh, engage in sexually abusive acts, and I can tell you this from years of experience, who do want help, who will accept if it's offered to them. And the recidivism rate, contrary to what tends to be out there in the public consciousness, is by no means as high as people tend to think it is. In fact, I mentioned in my written testimony that a study published by the Office of Justice Programs that looked at the sex offender recidivism rate as a group found it to be lower, lower than the recidivism rate for people who commit other kinds of serious offenses and yet almost all of the current public perception and public policy is based on exactly the opposite assumption. 
So again, I thank you for letting me come here today. I realize that some of my works are a little bit against the, the grain of what you may sometimes uh, think. Uh, I assure you that I'm very concerned about protecting victims. I know every single decent human being is. But until we stop demonizing all offenders, polarizing, acting as though all of them are less than human, they don't have families, they don't have people that care about them, uh, in my judgment at least, uh, it moves us backwards and not forwards. Thank you very much, Mr. Berlin. Ms. Hillman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'd like to talk a little bit about military law, which I think is part of the problem as well as part of the answer to the, the grim and important and vexing issue of sexual violence in the armed forces. I want to suggest that war is not the primary context in which American military law has been made, but rape is the primary context in which it's been made. And that has some consequences for understanding how much criminal justice can be part of the solution here and how much military criminal justice will not solve this problem for us. The first point I'd like to make is that the effort that the armed forces and the U.S. government has put into solving this subset of military sexual violence, that is, violence directed against service members by other service members, which is really a small part of what the larger issue is, but the resources we have put into that are extraordinary, I think. They're evidenced by the work that this this committee has done. They're evidenced by work across across the armed forces, the different branches of service, commanding officers who have spoken out against this, and many different programs that have been initiated in the military. It's also evident in the doctrines of the military courts. Contrary to what casual observers might think, military rape law is not backward and behind the times. In fact, the doctrine of constructive force, the idea that the force required to perpetrate a sexual assault could be not physical necessarily, but could be coercive. That came about in military courts in the 1950s. Likewise, the statute that governs the sexual assault in the military has been significantly revised. Just, uh, just a year ago, we have a much more complex, perhaps unmanageable, um, article to prosecute military sexual assault now, than, now compared to what we had in the past. Um, yet, these changes have not solved the problem. Um, nor have the, the efforts to train and to educate service members solved the problem. I think part of the problem is that the culture of the military uh, is linked to that law, and part of that culture and that law makes rape and sexual violence a norm in military circles, a part of authentic soldiering rather than not a part of soldiering. I think that many military legal precedents, because they are grounded in sexual assaults and in domestic violence, they create an assumption that women are vulnerable, they create an assumption that, uh, that sexual stereotypes, that racial stereotypes are the norm and that persons act on those um, in, in, in the arena of sexual interaction and assault and coercion, and that this has a tremendous impact. I'd like to suggest then that no matter how many service women we have in positions of authority, no matter how much rhetoric we uh, subject men and women who are in our armed forces about the, the necessity of ending this problem, that we need to break that link between sexual violence and war, between soldiering and rape. And I think one of the ways that we can consider doing that is by prosecuting at least some sexual assault in civilian rather than military courts. I don't think the court martial is necessarily the right place for these sorts of prosecutions to happen. Now the objection to that is a valid one, and that's the objection that it's important for a commanding officer to protect all of his or her troops, including those troops who are victims of sexual violence, those who are survivors, those who are perpetrators, to get them the help that they need to stop this from continuing to happen and to protect the, the uh, civilian population as well as the other, uh, other service members from those persons. That that's a fundamental function of command. But we're already breaking that in some ways by the changes that we've made, by allowing restricted reporting by, by service members who have been assaulted, by not having commanders get full knowledge of the accusations against individuals in the military who are accused of <coughs> perpetrating sexual assaults. This is not to demonize those folks. This is just to say that one way we could consider trying to break that link between war and rape, uh, between uh, what seems like a trans-historical and in some ways hopeless problem to solve is by taking the prosecution away from military courts, by making rape and sexual assault get prosecuted in, in civil courts, um, as the majority of the rape that takes place in the military is not specifically military in nature. It's not a crime of war. It's an acquaintance rape. It's a rape um, among uh, uh, young people who have abused alcohol, for instance. It's um, many different types of um, sexual assault take place, but certainly a significant part of it is in that realm. There's no reason that you need a specifically military court 
to adjudicate those sorts of questions and to reach a decision about the guilt or innocence of a person accused in that sort of case. Uh, that's, a, that's but one part of what might be a solution and, uh, and a, a, a part of how the law that governs this area of, of human interaction and military interaction is part of the problem too. Thank you. Thank you. That was interesting. Uh, Professor Benedict. Thank you. Um, I'm very honored to have been invited here today. Um, in researching my book, The Lonely Soldier, The Private War of Women Serving in Iraq, I spent the last three years interviewing over 40 military women who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan, along with some men. And I've also been examining veteran studies and surveys about sexual assault and military culture. I found that many women are being prevented from serving their country as they wish by systematic sexual abuse in the military. Um, soldiers commit sexual assault because of a confluence of several things, some of which have been mentioned here. Military and civilian cultures, individual psychology, and the nature of war, particularly of the war in Iraq. But given my time limit today, I'll concentrate on military culture. The American military has historically been a masculine organization deeply suspicious of women, and this has been slow to change. As a sergeant recently put it to me, in the army, if you show any sign that you are a woman, you are automatically ridiculed and treated as inferior. Military language reveals this attitude to women only too often. Drill instructors denigrate recruits by calling them girls, ladies, and more vulgar terms for women. The everyday speech of soldiers is riddled with sexual insults, and military men still sing the misogynist rhymes that have been around for decades. See the written testimony I submitted here for an example of a marine basic training song that's so violent I can't speak the words aloud. Many women soldiers have told me that they feel that the view of women as inferior is upheld by the Pentagon's, Pentagon itself. As long as women remain banned from ground combat, the message is sent from the top that women are second-class soldiers who will never earn the full respect of their comrades. This is extremely important when you think about sexual assault because whatever the um, motivation of any individual rapist is, a profound resentment of or lack of respect for women is part of it. <clears throat> women are not only seen uh, very often in, as inferior in the military, however, but as sexual prey. An army specialist who served in Iraq for 11 months said to me, one guy told me he thinks the military sends women over to give the guys eye candy to keep them sane. He told me in Vietnam they had prostitutes, but they don't have those in Iraq, so they have women soldiers instead. Common within the military is another set of age-old assumptions that, that acts against women who are trying to find justice for rapes, that women invite rape, that those who report sexual assaults are liars intent on ruining a man's career, and that men must be protected from such accusations at all costs. Thus, a woman who tries to report an assault often finds herself up against a solid wall of male camaraderie determined to silence her. Some women are silenced by counter charges, some are physically threatened, some are punished on other charges to undermine their credibility, credibility. some are in, uh, intimidated by the common view of her as a weak and a traitor if she um, reports an assault. Um, these are some of the reasons why, according to the Defense Department's most recent report, some 80 to 90 percent of military sexual assaults are never reported. The suspicion of women is also revealed in the military's abysmal record when it comes to arresting, prosecuting, and punishing its rapists. Uh, in 2008, a mere 10.9% of all reported assaults went to court martial, and among those men found guilty, 62% were given punishment so mild they amounted to a mere slap on the wrist. To even begin to change these attitudes and to fully integrate women so that they can serve their country without fear of being subjected to sexual persecution and discrimination, I suggest these eight reforms. End the Pentagon ban against women in combat, which is paradoxical and archaic. Women are in combat in Iraq and promote more military women. Educate all officers and enlistees to understand that rape is an international war crime. Expel all men who are found guilty of attacking military or civilian in any way from the military forever. Increase the severity of punishment for violence against women to be more in line with those in the civilian judicial system. 
ban the use of sexist language by drill instructors, educate all officers to take as much pride in protecting their soldiers from harm at one another's hands as from the enemy, train counselors to help male and female soldiers not only with war trauma but childhood and sexual assault, and last but not least, we have to rescind the don't ask, don't tell policy, which c codifies discrimination and is used disproportionately against women to drum them out of the military. Thanks. Thank you very much. We appreciate the testimony of all of our witnesses, and thank you for, for sharing it with us. Uh, I'm going to yield the time initially on the questioning to uh, Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon has, uh, as Mr. Turner mentioned, been on the, in the forefront of this issue for considerably longer than most members of Congress and many others, and has uh, really been a champion of trying to make sure that we address this in a responsible way uh, and stay on it until it is uh, effectively and fully addressed. So, uh, Ms. Harmon, we recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this working? It yes. will be. If you just pull it down just a little bit, Jane. It will be. Thank you. I don't know if it gets low enough. Good. Yes. Well, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Turner, for uh, uh, fo focusing the attention of the Oversight uh, Committee on these issues. Um, a few minutes ago on the House floor, uh, we did pass the DOD authorization bill. That's the reason we inconvenienced all of our witnesses. And that bill, as Mr. Turner said, uh, contains some very useful language that he and I uh, co-authored to try to push uh, DOD and the military services to do more about investigations, prosecutions, and protection of those who come forward. I, I, Mr. Turner gave me a shout-out a few minutes ago uh, about the role that I played. I just want to return the favor. Um, the Lauterbach family, who's daughter uh, and her unborn fetus were brutally murdered, uh, lives in his district, and they are very well served by his advocacy. And, and to you, Mr. Tr uh, Mr. Chairman, um, yeah, I've been around here a long time, and these are issues that move me personally. I, I see them as both a force protection and a moral issue uh, to protect those who put their lives on the line for our country. Uh, but you've been there, too, and we've met. Uh, incredibly impressive women in our intelligence services and our military services all over the world. Uh, they have the capability uh, and, in most cases, uh, the, the, the platform uh, to serve with great distinction. And it infuriates me uh, that those who step up can be compromised. And I, I really appreciate the, the testimony of, of all the witnesses uh, about this. Um, uh, Dr. Hellman, your testimony intrigued me particularly because you basically said, let's bail on mili the military court system. We can't find folks uh, who will provide the justice we need. We have to go outside to the civilian se sector, which we know does a much better job of this problem. Um, let, me, let me set the context. Uh, I have talked about this issue personally because I'm so passionate about it to our current Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, to our current Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Mike Mullen, uh, to our immediate past Secretary of the Army, Pete Guerin. Uh, all of these folks you wouldn't automatically think would, would share this passion, but they all seem to. Uh, in, in the case of uh, Secretary Guerin, uh, he got so passionate about this that he personally uh, pushed for a five-year campaign in the Army called the I Am Strong campaign, which is, had been initiative, initiated uh, I was there uh, on day one, uh, the goal of which is to eliminate all rape and sexual assault in the Army, a million-person group, in five years. And he figured out that he had to go outside to get uh, investigators and prosecutors, and he did that uh, to help train Army folks to do this right. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure how far along his efforts are, but I'm going to urge our colleague John McHugh, who will succeed him, uh, to take up the cudgel here, or take up the banner. And so given that, and given the fact that Mullen has uh, said to me, keep the pressure on, and that Gates was infuriated when the head of SAPRO, which is the office at DOD, um, charged with at least um, doing some things with respect to victims, uh, was prevented from testi testifying by her senior officer, um, Given their, their statements and, I believe, their beliefs, uh, 
should we give up on the military now, or do you think we could we could change the culture? And let me just add to this endless question um, one more thing, um, and that is that uh, Pete Guerin told me that he sees this as a challenge similar to racial integration of the services 65 years ago or so. Uh, it is a ma the major cultural challenge of our age, and the Army and the military have to take it head on. So... Given all that, um, want to reconsider? Thank you for the opportunity to respond. I, I wouldn't give up on the military. I've not given up on the military or on military lawyers or on military judges, but I think they need help on this issue now. And I think that, uh, that civilians could do a better job. And I, um, I actually think the parallel to racial integration is a powerful one. And uh, I remember um, when I was in the Air Force, I was uh, nominated for Company Grade Officer of the Year. I went before a senior board, and they asked me what um, the most important challenge was facing the military in the future. And I said, handling the integration of women. Um, and I was, uh, I was 22, and I knew a lot more than I do now. At least I thought I did then. Um, and... Uh, um, Anyway, it, it's, I, I agree that it's a huge problem. I will say that the, the racial uh, challenges of prosecuting sexual assault remain in the military. Capital defendants in the military are predominantly African-American. Those on death row are predominantly African-American. And the high-profile sexual assaults are um, predominantly prosecuted, have been, against African-Americans. It is not a place in which racial equality has resonated across military justice. My time has, my time has expired, but... Uh... I think it's a challenge that military leaders are taking on, and I think there are ways to do much better. Um, this is a, a bright spot, for, I think, in, 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 in a couple of committees in this Congress, one of which is this one. And I just want to conclude my testimony by thanking you both for the attention you're paying to this and will pay to it um, if, you, uh, if you are prepared to make the ultra ultimate sacrifice for your country. Your country has to be fighting for you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Hammond. Mr. Turner. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, I also want to recognize uh, Ms. Davis, who's, who's joined us, who's the head of the Personnel uh, Subcommittee on Armed Services. Um, and um, uh, Ms. Davis uh, incorporated in her mark uh, many of the provisions that uh, Jane Harmon and I had worked on, and I want to, to thank her for that. That's the bill that was passing today that Jane and I were talking about earlier that included provisions that, that hopefully will make a difference. <clears throat> One of the things that I, I find uh, really um, an opportunity in this topic is that although each case or circumstances may be unique, um, the, the issue of how it's handled comes up to the issue of, of culture, rules, and regulations, and gives us a picture at times of things that we need to change. Uh, with the Lauterbach case, you know, we were very surprised to find that the military protective order that had been issued had been allowed to lapse solely out of, of neglect, uh, which led us to, well, these should never lapse. Uh, then it led us to that the locals did not know that a military protection order had been issued. Um, and so when she came up missing and, they, and the police were called, they had no information whatsoever that there was someone else that they needed to check with who might have put her at risk. Um, and the issue today that we have of the, the ability of um, someone who's the subject matter of a military protective order to transfer, um, where some of the people who were involved in the military protective order were, don't even have the appropriate information or the channels as to how do I how do I transfer? It's it's so different in a um, in the military setting because we have custodial care of the individuals that are involved. Um, if if someone deems that that um, their work environment is unsafe and they're not in the military, um, they can quit their job. They can move out of town. They they have the freedom of movement, something that you lose once you've committed yourself to the military, and so. A lot of the things that we learn relate back to how do we how do we change the rules and regulations to ensure protection and, and safety prosecution. Um, but in looking at these, we we still come back to the issue of, of culture, and I'm going to ask you each to, to speak about that for a moment because the thing that that is stunning to me is that it appears, even when you don't have a tragedy, as in the Lauterbach uh, case where Maria came forward, made allegations of rape, and then ultimately was murdered. 
um, that that even if a woman does does not have a safety issue, even if she comes forward and makes the allegation of rape, and and ultimately uh, you know her life is not as risk as Maria's was, there's still a tremendous career price to be paid. Uh, frequently, if a woman comes forward. Um, it's not merely that she's had the tragedy of the sexual assault that has occurred, but then there is the issue of how in the military it, it affects her career. And, and that's, again, something that you don't have in the private sector. In addition to freedom of movement, a woman in the, the private sector who is a victim of sexual assault, no one is ever going to say, well, you're not going to be as good of a lawyer, you're not going to be, be able to pursue your career with, with vehemence, and her, um, her ability to continue to pursue her career is, is, is unimpacted. Um, I wondered if you talk for a moment about the issue of, of, of culture and um, uh, any of the issues that you might be familiar with, with rules and regulations, because those are the ones that we can impact. But I think the cultural issue is really important. How do we, how do we address this culture, not just for prevention, which is incredibly important and we need to address, but, but when a sexual assault claim has been made, um, that individual is up against a culture that, that is, is either... Um, um, not necessarily su supportive of um, their coming forward, but is, is also subject to a culture that I think they could be paying a price in their career. I, I'd like your thoughts on that. Dr. Valerie, Dr. Berlin, who, whoever would like to speak first. Well, I, I wanted to say that you're absolutely right, but, but um, this particular military culture completely magnifies everything that women or any victim, and I will include male victims of sexual assault, because as there's no room for female victims of sexual assault in the military, there's even less room for male victims of sexual assault. But this culture, it incredibly magnifies what we find. As I said, it's a closed system. There's a return to the assault environment. There's reliance on that particular community, whereas a woman in not only do they have freedom of movement in the uh, outside world, they have freedom to change support systems, which they do not in a military. Um, the other thing is um, there's an increased perception of benefits for false allegation in the military that I've noticed, and there's an exacerbation of the idea that all of these are non-stranger rapes, which are very hard to prosecute generally, but extra hard to prosecute in the military as well. Yes. Um, I would like to add, I think that on the level of um, the enlisted, where camaraderie and group loyalty is paramount, um, you're not going to be able to change the conception that anybody who tattles on anybody else about anything is somehow a traitor. But I think it can come from the command. And um, I've seen studies of this, and I've also heard many troops testify to this to me, that when um, a, co a, command, a commander of a given uh, company or, or even of a pl platoon or even down to a squad has the attitude that the way he keeps, he or she keeps his platoon um, looking good and his career looking good is by following injustice and prosecuting and, and doing the proper things to protect uh, his or her uh, troops, it can make a huge difference to how much sexual assault actually happens and to how the, how the troops treat each other every day. But if the command is one of those who prefers to keep the, the, his reputation squeaky clean by covering up any kind of wrongdoing and turning a blind eye, then the opposite happens. Um, and th this, is, these are, this is a choice that commanders have, which kind of, of commander to be. And I think we can address that through education in the academies and through education of, of the non-commissioned officers as well. Mr. Turner, I think it's a great point about what to do with those persons who are are able to come forward and uh, try to prosecute and uh, initiate investigations of sexual assaults. What happens to them afterwards? I think it's possible, though, to integrate their experiences into the broader military culture. And here's why I think that's so. War is about survival in many ways. We want our soldiers to be able to handle things that are difficult and come through on the other side. What could be more difficult than surviving this sort of trauma, standing up before it, um, letting everybody know that it happened and then working to resolve that. And 
I actually think a part of this is connected to our larger issues about mental health for service members and for veterans, and that we need to recognize that those persons who experience trauma can, and in fact often do, survive and are resilient and come back more powerful. And that's a cultural um, part of the armed forces and of our military culture that commanding officers um, need to not only do the right thing in terms of prosecuting and, and establishing the culture, but integrate stories of surviving incidents like this and standing up to prosecute them into the larger training environments of, of military life. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Uh, Ms. Davis, I want to first congratulate you on the, on the work that you did on this bill, particularly with regard to this issue and your work that you've had on an ongoing basis uh, on the, in the entire matter on that and give you an opportunity to, to question the witnesses. They on now? Is that, okay, good. Some uh, of them don't shut off. <laughs> Others we can't get on. Thank you so much, and I, I'm very sorry I wasn't able to be here for your testimony. I had a chance to look over um, a, a few of, of your statements, however, and uh, so I wanted to have a chance to, to ask you a few questions about that. And uh, I, I just appreciate the fact that you're talking about resilience here as well, and I think that what we're seeing in the military is that there are some families and there are some men and women who are able to take out of their experiences something that makes them stronger, whereas others, as we, we know, and we would assume um, with the kind of adjustment problems that they have come, returning, that there would be some major troubles ahead trying to figure out how, how do you mitigate uh, that for for folks, and how do you how do you really support the resiliency? And it's it's a difficult question whether we're dealing with um, sexual abuse and trauma or not, and and that's something that really has to be dealt with. I um, I was also interested, and I think that uh, this is probably to Professor ben, uh, Benedict, and you mentioned uh, what you know what can we do? How how can we help with this? And and I think talking about the culture. One of the things that we heard at, at a hearing, and you know, this is pretty commonsensical, I think, is that in some ways in the military you have um, what's considered, you know, a, a, toxic, a toxic mix of sorts. You have a, a lot of very risk-prone individuals who who go into the services. We know people who, you know, 20% of the population essentially is fit for the, you know, fit physically, mentally, and and, and goes into the services. And of that group, uh, a large number of people, you know, as kids, they were more uh, ready to jump out of trees and and take risks than other folks might be. So you have you have some of that. You also have the possibility that more women according to some of the statistics, have had prior sexual trauma in their lives who go into the military. I don't know whether that's something that you've all found in your research or not, but, you know, if that's the case, then we, you know, there are some possibilities there that, that might not be in, in other groups of, of individuals. And I wondered if you could comment on that. And, and then going to some of your uh, your issues that you raised, I think, um, partly about, you know, the language that's used uh, in, in training, that certainly plays a role. Is it an overwhelming role? Do pe you know, does it change people or people who are more apt to see women uh, in that light? It's only confirming for them, but maybe not necessarily life-changing for them. Uh, I wanted to have you talk a little bit about banning the sexist language of drill instructors, that issue. And, um, and also then just the penalties uh, inherent in that. And one, other, one or two other quick, quick questions. You, you just touched on it a little bit. How do we, within the services, use the ability to work well with the troops in this area as a career enhancement uh, merit? Uh, and I, I don't know that you can necessarily say that if you haven't had to deal with this in your command, uh, that therefore you're glossing over it or you're, you're avoiding it. But on the other hand, we ought to do something um, in, in the career path and in rewarding people who deal well with it. It ought to be just like a whole lot of other criteria that are used in terms of how you really evaluate the command. We have raised that on a number of occasions with the military, and they basically say that, you know, it's really part of what we look at. But there may be something special that you've encountered that you could suggest a better way of actually assessing the extent to which those in command um, are doing okay with this, are actually uh, educating their troops at the same time. Thank you very much for um, 
all those all the, the questions and for bringing to mind several things that I wished I'd had a chance to say that I can now about the statistics um, there were two uh, really important studies one done in the army and one done in the Marines um, that showed that about half half of the men who enlist um, were physically abused as children and half the women were sexually abused and some, many were both. So we do have a large population of the military who enlisted to escape violent homes. Um, and therefore they're coming into the military with problems, which is why I mentioned very briefly that our tr uh, we need counselors within the military, on the ground, in Iraq with them, not only the combat stress counselors we already have in place, but people who are trained to deal with childhood sexual trauma as well as whatever happens in the military to people um, to help them. This, this, this goes to um, Dr. Berlin's point to, to help them before they start acting out because there have been studies that have shown abused men often turn into abusive men. <clears throat> um, not always, but often. Um, so that's one way we could, we could acknowledge that that's an issue in the military and we could try and address it and stop it before it starts to become part of the problem. Um, Language, we do have a precedent. I mean, uh, drill instructors are already banned from using racist words and from cursing. So we, we've already done that. So I think it should be accepted to be able to say you can no longer call women, and, uh, I mean, you can no longer call recruits by these denigrating words for women. And in fact, it doesn't make any sense to put down recruits by calling them ladies when some of them are ladies. So that's, it's archaic and it needs to go. Um, the, um, the last thing, you, I, I know I'm not going in order here, but, um, oh yes, civilian culture. Part of training in boot camp, basic training, a great, I mean, a great deal of it is about dismantling the civilian inside a recruit and building up a soldier instead. Part of that, I mean, some of the, the, the things that are dismantled, I think, um, you know, are rather precious and it's too bad, but... Um, part of civilian training that many <clears throat> of them, that we all get is, a, is a, a derogatory attitude towards women. So perhaps as part of breaking down the civilian and building up the soldier could be breaking down res disrespect for women and building up respect instead, seeing women as comrades instead of as sexual prey. Um, and finally, I, I had, it had occurred to me as I was speaking before that this idea of rewarding commanders who do follow up justice for the victims um, in, their, in their command is, is, would be a splendid way to go about it, um, to acknowledge that they've done the right thing, not just to punish those who intimidate, which I think should be done too. I think there should be consequences for commanders when women are shut up but um, rewarding those who, who do pursue the case and stand up for those who've been abused in their command. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Um, Dr. Vallier, let me ask you, you mentioned uh, some of the traits that one might likely find in, uh, in a perpetrator on that, and others have mentioned that as well. Are we doing enough to try to screen recruits uh, to identify some of these indicators and uh, then to try and, and begin counseling at that stage or um, setting up barriers to people that we know are going to be a problem or can we identify people and, and identify that they're so likely to have a problem uh, that we ought to do something about it at that stage? Uh, I, I don't really know what the screening process is, but I do know that when we refer back to culture, there are things in this military culture that actually encourage um, when you have an us versus them mentality, you encourage callousness towards victims, especially if they're the enemy. But along with what Professor Benedict says, I think the, um, the disregard and the disrespect for women isn't really ultimately a disregard for women, but it appears as a disregard for women because we devalue vulnerability and we condition in this culture to overvalue power, overvalue dominance, and overvalue some of the character traits that, when they're adaptive, 
they may be successful tools in the military. And so part of when you talk about breaking down the civilian, you're also encouraging this idea that vulnerability equals weakness, and in our society, weakness equals women. And so there's this big attachment. So one of the things there may be in terms of the education to educate some flexibility in that idea, some idea of honoring vulnerability, and, and some flexibility. It's the personalities that are so criminal and narcissistic and callous that out of the context where they're useful, they are not flexible. So you have a general callousness and entitlement and arrogance through the unit as well as in a particular situation where those things might be necessary. Say in, in a clinical setting with a surgeon, you have to have those characteristics of being confident and, and not get caught up in the emotion of it. And that's somehow gotten distorted with some of these personalities. Thank you. Um, Dr. Berlin, you, you mentioned that you thought that we sometimes legislate the exception as opposed to the rule. Uh, can you help us out with that? To show us where do you specifically uh, point to on that regard and, and what might we do to change that dynamic? Well, again, I, I want to make it clear. My area of expertise is simply in the area of sexual disorders and offenders in general, so I'm not as well versed as some of you folks are in the military specifically. Uh, but examples uh, have to do with the fact that um, uh, most of um, child abuse, for instance, is committed by people who are well known to the child, family, acquaintances, and yet much of the legislation in the general public of, of reporting, of identifying individuals is centered around the idea that they're somehow going to be unknown to, to others. Um, I think the, the, the broad brush approach that's out there uh, is another example of what I'm talking about. Years ago when we first started the so-called war on drugs, and I'm talking back in the 70s, people could get a 50-year sentence for an ounce of marijuana because we didn't make distinctions about the various subgroups of people that existed who had difficulties with drugs. Uh, we have people now who are um, uh, identified on uh, registration lists as offenders uh, who have looked at pictures and have never had a contact offense. Now, if there's evidence that this is a predisposer to contact offenses, that's one thing. But if it isn't, we have to keep in mind that when we identify someone on a registry, we identify their, their family, we identify their children. I don't want to get too much into anecdotes, but I had an example of a, 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 a man who came in. They were going, the teacher was meaning well and reading out the list of people who had been um, registered offenders. And everyone turns to this one kid in the class and says, is that your father? And by the way, were you the victim? Something was in pretended, intended to protect somebody who created all sorts of harm. So just as with drug addiction, alcoholism, and so on, there are huge distinctions, there are huge variabilities, and I think we have to have laws that are going to take that into account and not this sort of throwing everything at everybody as though it's all the same. That, that's what I meant by what I had said. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hillman, you mentioned that some of the current uh, regulations that we have regarding this are unmanageable in some respects, or you fear they might be. We you uh, elucidate on that a little bit? The new Article 120, the uh, rape statute in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, um, has not had much time on the ground for us to get a lot of evidence about it. But it sets out uh, 14 different, some 14 different crimes that used to be prosecuted under the general article of the UCMJ, Article 134, are now specified under Article 120. And we don't have uh, a depth of jurisprudence on how those are going to be worked out, what standards will be applied, what, what, uh, what sorts of crimes will end up um, under that statute. Now, the, uh, the attempt to codify and to specify are a good thing, a, a, a continued modernization of a system that has been modernized since World War II uh, with, the, with the UCMJ. But, um, but it is part of what Dr. Berlin is talking about. It sweeps a tremendous amount of stuff um, into one umbrella, Article 120, the rape, what used to be the rape and carnal knowledge statute, that it's not clear it all comes from the same place or that the solutions are in, the, are in um, especially aggressive prosecution, more attention to deterrence, more attention to eliminating the, the workplace environment issues that actually Mr. Turner talked about too, that are distinctive to the military. That is, the military is both workplace and home place for for many persons, and as that, it's not a place that people can opt out of easily. And to sweep all sorts of things, indecent exposure and uh, um, uh, access to materials and all that, uh, all the, the pornography offenses that are charged under that particular statute, risks eliding the differences between things that are demonstrably different. Well, 
Thank you. Maybe we have to revisit that. We'll, we'll uh, certainly consider that. Mr. Turner, would you like to ask any further questions? Well, again, I would like to thank each of you for your testimony. Um, a lot of the, the testimony that we have that concerns the military is, is anecdotal information. Um, I want to make clear, just for one footnote, that even though we're pursuing this issue of, of sexual assault in the military, how do we address it? How do we do prevention, prosecution, and safety? How do we address um, culture, policy, and laws? Um, I wouldn't want anyone hearing this to get the misimpression that anyone believes that there's something inherent to the military that that um, um, that, that is causing or or is. Um, um, our view is not that, that we're prosecuting the military and raising this issue. We're raising an issue that addresses the, the issue of men and women who are in the military. Well, when you pick up an issue that as to what has happened to an individual or you look at, at, at culture, um, we, we're not, not here saying that the military is a bad place or that there are bad people there, and, but there are sometimes, even with good people, um, bad things that happen when you have um, a, a significant population, such as in the military. Um, the issues that we had talked about before of, of custodial um, possession of the people who are in the military, the, the close proximity, are, are things that, that also exacerbate the issue for, for things that we need to address in our laws, culture, and the like. I just felt the need to say that because I think sometimes when we talk about this, someone could get the impression that, um, that when you pick up an issue that's a bad issue, that you want to feel like figure out how to deal with it, how to address it, and how to resolve it, that you're not using a broad brush uh, to paint an entire institution or, or people who are serving their country uh, poorly. Now, to my question. Um, I participated in a, in a lot of these, and, 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 um, and I have a particular um, a memo that I want to share with you uh, that, that I've shared in every hearing that I've participated, and it gets right to the issue of culture. Um, in, in culture, we, we have anecdotal, st anecdotal stories. It's hard for us to pick up a culture and examine it. We can examine a policy, and we can examine a law or rule or regulation. But a culture is a hard thing to ascertain. And I'm going to read to you uh, an answer that was sent to me by Lieutenant General uh, Kramlich, U.S. Marine Corps, Director of Marine Corps Staff, um, in a series of responses to questions I asked about the Lauterbach matter. Uh, after Maria Lauterbach was murdered, there was a press conference that occurred, and there was a statement that I found troubling that seemed to indicate uh, that the Marine Corps had no notice or no knowledge that she could be at risk, that her safety was a concern, um, because there had been no violence that she had reported. Well, she reported a sexual assault. Um, that's inherently violence. And so that was very troubling to me, and I thought that if I asked a straightforward answer to the Marine Corps that I would get a straightforward answer that hopefully would give us all a, a nice cleansing breath with respect to that, the implications of sexual assault's not violent. So I asked this question. Doesn't a rape accusation inherently contain an element of force or threat? And this is the answer I got. Um, as defined in Article 120 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, rape is defined as the sexual intercourse by a person executed by force and without the consent of the victim. Then they go on to apply it to the specific facts of this case. And they say in May 2007, when uh, Lauterbach formally made allegations of rape against Lorien, the command was only made aware of two reported sexual encounters. One sexual encounter characterized as consensual by Lauterbach and the other alleged by her to be rape. Lauterbach never alleged any violence or threat of violence in either sexual encounter. Now that just does not make, that to me is an issue of culture. And we even have the citation of the law. This is rape. <laughs> threat force or, or threat of force of, of rape. Um, and then we have, when we have facts that are applied, and then we have policy. And out comes th this cultural statement of Lauterbach never alleged any violence or threat of violence in either sexual encounter, one of which in this answer they identified as rape. And I think that gives us a window to culture. And that's why this has been such an important issue for me on the cultural side, because I think we need to drill down to that. I wonder if you would want to comment. I guess I, I don't hear any criminalization of the military in what you're saying, but this is the reality is is this is a particular culture. It's a 
it's a culture that's defined by different boundaries, rules, systems, hierarchy, prosecution, and what personality attra attracts. In my uh, testimony, I equated it similar to a prison culture, but we could also equate it to a college fraternity culture in which there is certain cultural challenge challenges and certain aspects of that culture that not only attract certain personalities that can be problematic, but separate the victim from certain types of resources that they might otherwise have. So um, it takes all the stereotypes, myths, everything we have, including the culture, sociocultural elements of male domination, uh, degradation of women and vulnerability, the uh, group psychology and it magnifies those and offers us particular challenges in not only the, um, like I described as the collusion and collaboration of the environment with a certain personality to create an offender, but then a certain collaboration with the offender to protect them from prosecution and to separate the victim from their supports. I think your example also demonstrates the tremendous need for education. I mean, here's someone who's equating physical force with violence and doesn't understand that an, a violent act can occur even absent an act, actual physical act. And these are things that can be taught. It doesn't mean everyone's going to get it, but if you don't at least make the effort, some people who would have gotten it don't. So I, I think we are hearing something about culture that is based on a failure to understand and appreciate properly, and, and the importance of education in that, it seems to me, is, is obvious. I think that it's not a demonization of the military to recognize that we put service members in harm's way in a way that subjects them to emotional uh, and mental stress that can have extraordinary consequences. The worst war crime in American history, the My Lai Massacre, the mother of one of the perpetrators, not, not a victim of that, of that crime, the perpetrator, she said, they took a good boy and made him a murderer about her son at having been recruited, having been drafted, actually, and, 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 and served in the army. Um, to say that uh, soldiers are made more likely to be rapists is a very challenging thing to say, but there is no doubt that the sorts of totalizing um, consequences of, of being asked to do things that we're asking soldiers to do puts them, puts them at risk of behavior that they, they would in fact disown, that we, uh, we deserve to give them support for recovering from, and that, um, that is a real part of understanding this problem in the military. Um. I would like to add, I sort of addressed this already in my testimony, but um, <clears throat> that when I was interviewing women who've been serving in Iraq, I didn't go into this looking for stories of sexual assault. I didn't even know that's what I would find, but that's what I heard. When they described their everyday lives to me, I felt as if I was reading about yeah, a fraternity from 1940. The attitudes towards rape are archaic, and your, your example illustrates that. <clears throat> it can be fixed with, with education, but there has to be a willingness to hear it. There's still a pervasive idea that women are really good for nothing but sex, and that rape is just sex, and with the woman regretting it afterwards, and many of those other old-fashioned ideas that have been used to dismiss rape as a serious crime and to dis dismiss women as serious soldiers. Thank you. Ms. Davis, unless you have any further questions? Well, a difficult one to ask you uh, right on the spot, but one of the things that uh, we, we have, have spoken about is what kind of messages, what kind of education is really helpful. And, and having watched a few of the videos, I, I was struck by the fact that I didn't think they were very compelling and uh, wondered whether the uh, men and women in the field were uh, a part of putting those together because I think that, that what they might see the way they might say it um, was different. I was reminded of uh, the teen pregnancy messages uh, years ago of trying to, you know, adults were creating them and, and young people were looking at them and saying, that wouldn't make any difference to me at all, but if you tell me I can't go out Saturday night, you know, those kinds of things. And, and I'm, what I'm just wondering is, have you seen any of... Um, the, the videos or the messages that are out there and, and is there, do you have a sense of critiquing or, or how, what do you think? I mean, if, if someone asked you, what, what would you like to sort of just stay in a kid's head 
uh, and, and recognizing, and I, I, I appreciate what Mr. Turner was saying. I don't think any of us here, and certainly my experience has been, this is not to, to say that the military is, is doing something um, which is, is counter to our, our, our values necessarily, but we know that on this, at the same time they, they are forced to, uh, to create some, some values in the services because they're asking kids to do uh, extraordinary, almost superhuman things. And so it, it is a different way of, of managing one's uh, emotions and one's um, physical prowess and all, all kinds of other things. But uh, what, what do you think, you know, should be out there? I mean, what, what is the message in a, in a way that you would like to see the military developing as a foundation for their, for their messages? Um, one of the things, there are two main components that we see, not only just for the military, but one, we really lack very good education on respectful, healthy sexuality, whether it's in the military or not. And that's even far exaggerated in, in these subcultures that are male-dominated. So we need to talk about that, how to be together and have sexuality, as well as uh, educate for an intolerance of an ex exploitation of that. The other thing we need to start educating is not just um, how not to be a victim, but how not to be an offender. What is consent? What is consensuality? What is uh, exploitation? As well as educating, there's a big movement in the public sector to educate about bystander apathy, basically. How to break that group norm when you're encountering sexual violence so that it, there is no collusion within the group to protect the offender, like in a fraternity or, or something like that. Well, uh, just brief, and then we're, we're getting late. Uh, but I, I think uh, you, you touched on this earlier. Uh, you know, we need to train people to be able to be violent in a controlled way, but we may also have to train them how not to lose their, their compassion, the, the, the sense that this woman is somebody's sister. This isn't just some object. And so maybe we can do more in the process of instilling what needs to get into a soldier to be careful to instill or at least not take away some of the other human qualities that are so important to be preserved. I have seen some of the training materials. I think they vary dramatically. Some of them, are, I think, are very effective, and some trainers are very effective, and others are not. I think the, the services are capable of sophisticated um, programs. Um, the uh, recruiting presence of the Army online, for instance, is an extraordinary marketing success, I'd say. So there's, it's clear that it's possible to reach, and I think it's mostly young people who, uh, who would be the primary audience that we, we, we would find receptive and, um, to all these sorts of training. Um, I'd also say that the policy message that we that we send about consensual sexuality is are critical too, and yeah. um, you know, ending the criminalization of consensual sex in the military is a part of this answer too. Ending the don't ask, don't tell policy, ending the criminalization of adultery absent aggravating factors, those are critical to to changing attitudes towards what really does constitute inappropriate criminal sexual behavior. I have to go back to my original point about the message from the top. Um, as long as women are still being banned from certain jobs, especially from ground combat, which is the, sort of the essence of soldier in most people's eyes, they're still going to be seen as second class. And um, I think the way to change attitudes in the military is, is not so much through trying to get people, men to see women as fellow human beings uh, through abstract ideas. It's to give women the chance to win the respect and, and to have the power and to have the positions so that they really are equal, so that they, they are, um, are in command, so that they have real authority. And this is happening more, but women are still vastly outnumbered. Um, but that's, that's what works in the military. Everybody has to win respect themselves. And the trouble with the education that we've just been talking about is that there's a, a danger of condescension in it. There's a danger of looking at women as, well, we have to make allowances for them. And I've never met a single <coughs> military woman who can stand that. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, promotion and um, re-examining the Pentagon's ban against women in combat. I think that's essential. Well, thank you. Thank all of you once again. I, not only did you give us good and extensive testimony here today that we appreciate, but you have 
uh, submitted written remarks, and there is a in our volumes of works that you're all responsible for, uh, very credible works that we appreciate and people have access to as well. We all have the, uh, the list of things that you've reported on this subject. So I believe you'll be, um, it, what you've said today and what you've written will be helpful as we assess uh, whether or not there's reports that come back at the, re at the end of the summer really do address in the way that we need to address this important issue. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience and for the work that you do. And thank my colleagues. This meeting is adjourned. Thanks. Thank you.